I know it's Berkeley habit to begin at 10 after the hour, but maybe we can improve on uh, old habits uh, since you all seem well settled in your seats. It's a good uh, group uh, and you're all very attentive and we've got a terrific program for you. So maybe I'll begin and take up at least a few of those minutes introducing our panel. Uh, I'm Jonathan Simon. In addition to being the Adrian A. Cragen Professor of Law here at Berkeley Law, I'm also the faculty director of the Center for the Study of Law and Society. And this wonderful panel is a co-production of two of our Berkeley Law Centers, in addition to the Center for the Study of Law and Society, the Berkeley Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies. And uh, my kind of uh, uh, counterpart, Ken Bamberger, also a member of the Berkeley Law faculty, uh, would very much have wanted to be here and unfortunately has been called away by a family uh, emergency and so not able to join us. But I wanted to take a moment to, to, to mention the centers and also their executive directors of Rebecca Goldberg and Roseanne Greenspan, because this event is really a wonderful example of what centers can do here. As many of you may know, we have a renowned faculty at Berkeley, but through our centers, we also have a, a shadow faculty, an invisible global faculty of tremendous intellectual depth that we keep deeply secret so that they can get some work done. But periodically, we realize that we have tremendous asset here for our community, for our scholarship, for our students. And really kudos to Roseanne and Rebecca for recognizing the tremendous synergies in the visitors between these centers this year. Because this topic that we're talking about today, the private sphere as public policy, is one, and as I think we can see from the group here, of just tremendous public policy interest globally today. And Israel simply happens to be one of the most interesting legal communities in which those global issues are being fought out today through a variety of institutions, including the Israel Supreme Court. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to introduce our panel uh, and our commentator, my colleague Malcolm Feely. I'm going to then get out of the way while each of them speaks for about 15 minutes or so. Malcolm will comment, and then we'll come back up for a Q&A, which I will uh, help to, uh, to coordinate. So let me introduce our speakers uh, and topics, and let me ask you to hold your applause until after the introductions, and we'll give them a good round to get them going. And I, I think this will, be, this will be the order in which they'll speak. Our first speaker uh, will be Hila Shamir, Associate Professor of Law in the Bookman Faculty of Law at Tel Aviv University. Uh, Hila earned a SJD and LLM from Harvard Law School and an LLB from Tel Aviv University. She has taught at Cornell Law School and at Harvard's Department of Government. She has served as a law clerk to Justice Maza of the Israeli Supreme Court. Some of you have heard her fascinating talk on labor trafficking last fall. Uh, today's talk on prison privatization, Hilla will look at the Israeli Supreme Court's very famous decision that held that private prisons violate uh, the right of human dignity. Next, we'll hear from Ori Aronson, Assistant Professor of Law at Bar Ilan University Faculty of Law and a founding member of the Center for Jewish and Democratic Law. Ori received an LLB from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and an LLM and SJ degrees from Harvard Law School. He served as a law clerk to Israeli Supreme Court Chief Justice Aron Barak, as well as Judge John O. Newman of the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. In Ori's talk today, he'll examine two Supreme Court decisions from the past several years concerning religious jurisdiction in Israel that together have shared an effect of empowering private community-based adjudication in significant fields of social activity. His talk's titled, Judging in the Shadow of the Law, Private Forums and Privatized Adjudication in Israel. Our third speaker today is Shira Offer, Associate Professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Bar Ilan University. She received her PhD in Sociology at the University of Chicago and was Research Analyst at, uh, at the Alfred P. Sloan Center on Parents, Children, and Work. Her articles have been published in leading sociological journals, including the American Sociological Review. Um, in today's presentation, titled, I've Got No One no One to Lean On, the Negotiation of Network Relations Among Low-Income Mothers in Israel Under a Neoliberal Discourse, Shira analyzes her study based on in-depth interviews with 50 low-income mothers in Israel. The fourth uh, speaker will be Avishai Benish, Assistant Professor in the Bar uh, Paul Berwald School of Social Work and Social Welfare at Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Avishai received his LLB uh, with honors in law and political science from the Hebrew University, and he holds an LLM with honors from Columbia University Law School. He's published in journals such as Law and Policy, Public Administration, and uh, <coughs> the Social Science, Social Service Review, excuse me. In his talk today, titled The Legitimacy, parenthetically, uh, price 
of welfare reforms. Avishai will ex examine the welfare reforms of 2005 and the implications of these transformations in welfare governance. Now, after we've heard from all four speakers, Malcolm Feely will provide some comments. As you know, our colleague Malcolm is the Claire Sanders Clements Dean's Professor of Law at UC Berkeley School of Law. He's a former director of the Center for the Study of Law and Society. He's the author of books too numerous to mention in many topics. We'll be holding a conference to celebrate Malcolm's scholarship next year, and uh, I will, he will offer commentary on all four of these. Uh, so I will go sit in the audience, and we'll hear first uh, from uh, Hila, and then uh, I will come back up to uh, invite you to ask questions and comments. Please. <clears throat> So uh, thank you so much, uh, Jonathan, for this very um, uh, generous presentation of all of us. And thank you to Malcolm Feely for agreeing to comment on all four papers. And thank you all, for all of you for coming. Um, so I'm going to talk today about prison privatization. And as uh, Jonathan mentioned, there is a very famous 2009 uh, um, high, uh, Supreme Court, uh, Israeli Supreme Court decision that I'm going to focus on. So in a 2009 opinion, the Israeli Supreme Court declared um, legislation that established a private prison in Israel as unconstitutional. The opinion came during a time of uh, growing criticism of the Israeli government's wide-reaching privatization agenda, which began approximately in the 1990s and gained uh, uh, more force in the early 2000s to this day. And all four, all, all four of us today will actually be engaging with what's going on in Israel in this field. Despite the traditionally controversial nature of judicial review in Israel, the opinion was declared by many from both right and left-wing parties as a constitutional and human rights triumph. The opinion received significant scholarly attention as well in Israel and abroad, and is often described as a revolutionary watershed moment in Israeli constitutional and administrative law. Indeed, the court here for the first time uh, ventured into a field that was previously uh, considered a political and ideological issue that was outside the reach of legal analysis, the question of can the uh, government decide to privatize or not. The prison privatization case was revolutionary in the court's willingness to address the question of the decision to privatize and set a constitutional limit to uh, privatization processes. However, in the talk today, I will argue that in relation to the private-public distinction and the division of power between the public and the private sphere, the case was far from revolutionary. In fact, it represents a conservative turn in, in that it strengthened, reinstated, and fetishized classic understandings of the different nature of the private sphere versus the public sphere in Israel. I will argue that this case was, in fact, a missed opportunity to develop a jurisprudence of private-public relations and the required regulatory supervision of privatization processes in Israel. Okay, so let's focus on the opinion. I, um, when I made this Prezi, it's the first time I'm working with Prezi. I hope it's going to work. When I made it, I thought I'll have time to talk about privatization and administrative law in Israel, but I don't. So, yes, it was revolutionary in that sense. Move on. Um, prison privatization opinion. So the prison privatization case struck down the Prison Privatization Act. It was actually an amendment to uh, the prison's order. I'll call it the Prison Privatization Act throughout uh, this lecture. So it struck it down. The Prison Privatization Act established the first private prison in Israel and was supposed to be a pilot program. So this was one prison out of um, complementing uh, public prisons in Israel. The legislative process leading to this uh, act was uncharacteristically thorough and deliberative. During this process, the various models, uh, various models of privatizations were considered, and after some deliberation, the legislator rejected uh, two models, the American, the US model, and, a, and the French model, and adopted what it called an improved British model. So the US model, that many of you uh, probably know, um, that was rejected by the Israeli legislator offers the most extensive privatization scheme under which basically all aspects of the prisons are of the prison are privatized. Um, so day-to-day -day administration and management are privatized, including the authority to discipline inmates while incarcerated. The French, the French model that was also um, uh, uh, not chosen offers a, a much more limited version of privatization. And what it does is it privatizes only logistical services, such as food catering, healthcare provision by a prison entity, while the management and administration of the prison remains public. 
the British model that was chosen in, a, in an improved version, uh, which inspired the Israeli legislation, uh, uh, is a form of privatization in which we have a private entity uh, that's responsible for prison administration and management, while there's a public agency that regulates and supervises the operation of the prison and has a final say regarding disciplining actions. The Israeli legislator created what was said to be an improved British model, under which extensive regulatory and supervisory mechanisms were instituted and the private entrepreneur powers, it was used, was thought of as a franchise, or sometimes called the franchisee, so the, this uh, private <coughs> corporation's power and discretion were severely restricted, and infringement on certain prisoners' rights meant um, uh, contract discontinuation. Here, the petitioners, petitioning the, the Israel High Court of Justice, mostly public interest organizations, argued that the act was unconstitutional based on two arguments. First, they argued, Article um, 1 of the Basic Law, the government, which states, and I'm going to read you all of it, it's very short, the government is the executive authority of the state, so that's all it said, the government is the executive authority of the state. They argued that it should be interpreted as mandating government uh, to operate by itself functions that are considered core functions of executive powers. The petitioners further argued that the core, this core includes the operation of prisons, a matter directly connected to the enforcement of criminal law, one of the most significant traits of sovereignty. The second argument that they made is that experience with prison privatization around the world shows that uh, there's a track record of violation of prisoners' human rights, specifically the rights to liberty and human dignity. Um, two rights that are protected under Israeli uh, basic laws. And such violations do not withstand a constitutional proportionality test under in, in, in Israeli constitutional law. So the petitioners filed their, their petition. As you could see from the first slide, it was uh, filed uh, in 2004, and the decision was, gave, was given uh, in 2009, so there was a huge gap. In the meantime, uh, the prison was constructed, but it didn't start operation. So it never start, started operation, actually, and. Um, the, the decision was given just before it was supposed to begin operation. Chief Justice Banish, um, writing for the majority, rejected the first argument. So the first argument was denied. She rejected the first argument, but accepted a version of the second argument. So regarding the first argument, uh, the court basically declined to identify a clear court to the state's executive authority on the basis of Article 1 of the Basic Law of the Government. Chief Justice Banish, however, uh, did uh, um, declare the act unconstitutional based on a partial exception of the second argument. So this, the, uh, what, she, what uh, the, the court decided is that the act infringes upon fundamental rights and power, uh, rights of the prisoners. However, the infringement does not stem from the petitioner's uh, consequentialist argument. So it's not because their human rights are necessarily, we know that they're going to be uh, violated because of uh, past experience. They actually found that uh, the, this it was not established that actually prison privatization does that necessarily. Um, what the court said is that it found that it was not as, uh, that that um, that the the sorry the court based its decision rather than on a consequentialist argument on a deontological argument, saying that an inmate has an independent constitutional right not to be subject to the use of coercive measures by employees of a private for-profit corporation, regardless of the actual conditions of incarceration. Um, so this is a quote from the, from, uh, the decision, basically uh, saying that there's something inherent about private power that violates the rights of, um, of, prisoner, of prisoners. Um, according to this view, the very act of implementing incarceration powers by employees of a private entity entity infringes upon the inmates' rights to liberty and human dignity in a way that does not withstand the Israeli constitutional proportionality test. It held that the harm to prisoners' basic rights outweighs the expected social benefits, namely budgetary savings, of operating a private prison. So the act was struck down based on an axiomatic assumption about the nature of the private versus the public and the symbolic implications of imprisonment by a private entity rather than by a public one. So if you read this quote, you can see 
that we're talking about an that it's inherent to the identity and the nature of the body that is operating. And, uh, and you can see the final sentence basically saying <coughs> that, um, uh, um, that, that the, these violations exist even if we assume uh, that from a factual empirical viewpoint it has not been proved that inmates the, uh, in the prison will suffer worse physical con conditions and, and so forth. <laughs> Chief Justice Banish's opinion, Banish's opinion exhibits what uh, may be termed as a form of institutional fetishism uh, in relation to the public-private distinction, which rejects any pragmatic exploration of the actual difference between the private sphere and the public sphere, public and private governance, and assumes the public-private distinctions remain inherently stable and static. For the court to reach a decision based on this a priori argument about the nature of the public and the private, it had to assume certain characteristics regarding each sphere. It assumed that the market has a single stable content. It operates only for profit and is both uncontrollable and unsupervisable. It further assumed that the state always operates to promote the public interest and, the action, and its actions are transparent to the public and effectively controlled by courts. These two assumptions mean that on the one hand, um, no regulation of the privatized prison would have been sufficient, and actually the court says that in so many words, uh, since this aspect of the market is inherent and therefore impossible to regulate. And second, it ignores the grave and well-documented failures of the Israeli public prison system where human rights violations occur frequently. Finally, it glossed, glossed over the fact that ongoing privatization, uh, uh, sorry, glossed over the fact of the ongoing privatization in the Israeli economy and welfare state in the last three decades that has already been, that has already taken root, leading to various complex public-private interactions in similar fields, such as involuntary psychiatric hospitalization, the foster care system, and cross-border, um, and bro uh, sorry, border crossing control. Um, and again, the other three talks today will give more examples of this. Only by disregarding such developments, the majority opinion could uh, avoid an investigation of the actual nature of the public-private distinction in Israel today in general, and in the proposed private prison in particular. The majority's decision refused to deal with the petitioner's argument about the consequences of privatization, or the respondent's argument about the extent and scope of state supervision and regulation. All of this didn't matter. Instead of looking at possible consequences and regulatory mechanisms, the court opted for a kind of a deductive exercise from a universal abstract constitutional norm of human dignity, joining it to an essentialist uh, understanding of the public and the private. The court's assumption regarding supervision, control, and the motives of private actors discounted the supervisory and regulatory mechanisms put in place by the present Privatization Act. The supervisory and regulatory mechanisms made the private less private. It created financial incentives that attempted to align the financial interest with the protection of prisoners' rights through some, through among other things, ensuring easy contract cancellation. And it applied the obligation of public servants to the private entrepreneur and its employees, borrowing from the doctrine of public-private hybridity developed in Israeli administrative law. In other words, though the private prison was clearly no longer a fu fully public enterprise, neither was it a fully private one. By maintaining a fixed view of the distinctness of the private and the public sphere, the court relieved itself from the need to closely examine these mechanisms, explaining that the details were of no consequences since the privatization in and of itself violated prisoners' human rights. The court's assumptions about the nature of public prisons similarly ignored the actual content of this public institution. Annual reports by the Department of Justice uh, revealed the harsh living conditions and systemic violations of prisoners' rights in Israeli public prisons. These reports have shown that uh, showed severe and extreme uh, punishment exists, prison guard violence, unhygienic living conditions, bed shortages, insufficient health care, discrimination against p Palestinian prisoners are all common characteristic of the public prison system in Israel. This, of course, does not mean that the solution to the problem is privatization. But it does mean that the image portrayed by the court of a public system that is inherently public regarding in a transparent and easily controlled manner is also far from true. So how inherently different are the public and the private spheres? 
And in the few minutes I have left, I'm just going to explore uh, this very briefly. Um, so legal realists and feminist critiques of the private-public distinction reveal the ideological, dynamic, and unstable characteristics of the distinctions. They show that while in theory the private and the public may be distinct, in reality the two are difficult to distinguish due to the vital role of the state in the constitution of the market through private law rules. Following this critique, it appears that a better understanding of the private and the public is not as two distinct spheres of human activity, but rather as a spectrum of institutional forms along which we can locate different institutional arrangements, none of which is only private or solely public, but rather the private and the public elements are interwoven in different ways. By assuming a stark distinction between the private and the public, the Israeli Supreme Court ends up making three problematic analytical moves. It ignores the, interdependent of the interdependence of the private and the public. It imagines them as two distinct spheres with stable uniform content and denies the dynamic nature of the institutions. And it assumes a strong distinction between private and public employees. Um, so I actually won't have time to go through each, uh, all three of these. Um, let me just um, say, um, let me just talk until my time ends. So, Malcolm, <laughs> you'll tell me when my time ends. How much time do I have left? Uh, you have two minutes. Okay, great. So, I'm going to start. Okay. <laughs> so, are the spheres clearly and necessarily distinct? The classic legal realist critique of the public-private distinction was that the liberal understanding of the public-private distinction ignores the fact that all law is both coercive, impacts liberty, and distributive, impacts equality, and accordingly, private law cannot be neutral. Rather, in delegating coercive public power to individual, private law inherently embodies public policy choices. So realists argue that the idea of regulative non-intervention in the private sphere serves as a, 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 serve as a misguiding rhetoric of neutrality when in fact non-intervention represents an ideological preference towards the status quo, and as such it is just as active, coercive, and distributive as any other regulative policy. The legal realists pointed to a deep institutional interdependency between the private and the public sphere. Mm -hmm. This insight became even more important with the rise of the regulatory state, where the private and the public spheres are interlocked in the tight grip of regulation. <clears throat> As the, at the greatest level of generality, the regulatory state represents a shift from a focus on redistribution and from majoritarian party political and national politics towards a non-majoritarian technocratic type of politics in which market coordination rather than ownership is the paradigmatic governance tool. The move towards a regulatory state does not merely shift to the private mar market functions um, that used to be uh, public state functions, but also redraws the boundaries between private and public and the content of each in a way that makes the spheres bleed into one another and intermingle in new ways that challenge the idea of their separateness and aspects of their institutional DNA. So what became increasingly clear, clear and perhaps even clearer after the 2008 financial sector bailout is that the idea of a free private market is more often so I'll just finish this and I'll, it's more often than not um, a mischaracterization. Um, while the massive bailout and regulatory reaction of governments after the collapse of the financial system reminded the public of the central position of the state and markets, it also reflects the increasing willingness of states to regulate markets as well as act as market actors without taking over direct ownership. Um, in these regulatory processes, both the public and the private spheres are transformed and the supposed boundaries between them become more difficult to detect. I won't have time to go through the other two. I'll just, um, just briefly uh, highlight them. So does each sphere have stable and uniform characteristics? We can just look at, um, at um, the, I think, you know, as a, as an as a, as a guest in the US looking at the healthcare system here is a clear example that the market is not always efficient, that sometimes it can be cumbersome and bureaucratic in many ways. Um, looking at Israel and land ownership that is totally, uh, that is mostly government based, you can clearly see how sometimes the uh, government is not uh, uh, looking at public interests is um, uh, in fact not other regarding in, in many ways. So there is a, a I, I was going to explore here various examples to show how these fears are 
are just labels, and, and we need to really explore them to understand what's going on. And finally, uh, I was going. Uh, I think it's it's important to think about the different the the different role of public and private employees. Um, the the decision assumes that public and private employees use the discretion in a, use their discretion in a very different way. Well, there's a whole body of scholarships about street level bureaucrats that shows that even within state bureaucracies, uh, we can see a lot of bias and discrimination that is based on, on individual preferences of workers, and that budgetary constraints are often a big part of of the story, even within um, state. Um, <coughs> Um, even even within the state. So just to summarize, um, I want to say that if we situate the, the prison privatization case in the wider context of the last three decades of sweeping waves of privatization in the Israeli economy, uh, it seems that the court's opinion is a missed opportunity to offer important guidance on privatization. From a pragmatic standpoint, in an era in which the public and private are significantly intertwined and are being transformed by social, economic, and political pressures, it would arguably have been more productive for the jurisprudential development of privatization doctrine in Israel to admit this dynamism and try to assess it on its own terms, focus more about the quality of new governance forms and functionality of the institutional structures created and the actual effects they have on human rights. I just want to finish by saying that the, uh, the court, the a private prison eventually there was a structure that existed it was sold back to the state and it now it's now part of the public uh, prison system and just to make it more real for you here are some pictures of how it looks it looks very much like a primary school um, um, of course this is um, when it was ju they were just starting to use it so who knows what it looks like several years after um, but that's just to get a sense of the public uh, of the of the physical um, uh, existence of it. So thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, good afternoon. Thanks again for everyone uh, for coming and uh, for coming to listen to us and to um, Malcolm, uh, Jonathan, Rebecca, and Roseanne for um, bringing this all together. Um, so, although I'm going to tell a story um, in which the same Supreme Court, in a sense, of, um, lent its hand to act of uh, institutional privatization. I think some interesting uh, ways you'll see that a few of my critiques are uh, quite similar to the ones he got presented just uh, just now. So we can sort of play with that uh, distinction in the uh, comments part of Q and A. So um, as Johnson mentioned, I'm going to discuss two episodes from the last uh, decade in which the Israeli Supreme Court was, if you will, facilitative and empowering private Jewish religious tribunals, what we call Batei Din or Bet Din in the singular, uh, in fields of social significance, right, commercial disputes in one case and divorce in the other. Um, so I will briefly kind of recount the two stories in an attempt to make two central points. Um, first, uh, maybe a more kind of familiar argument, what may be told as a relatively benign stories of workable solutions, of multicultural toleration and recognition, kind of solutions often sought in um, uh, divided countries like Israel. Um, especially, uh, it, um, can actually be sort of invoke more complicated trade-offs, um, especially when we deal with institutions of normative ordering, like courts, that belong to traditional uh, communities. And this is, a, this is an opportunity to invite you all to Michele Cariani's talk tomorrow, which is basically going to discuss similar tensions. Um, and my second main point, perhaps more interesting, um, will be right, that what may seem as an, perhaps an institutional dichotomy with a one-way vector of power and interest, private forms seeking to distinguish themselves from the state and want more power in the expense of the state, uh, while the courts are playing along in its decisions, um, is in fact a more delicate uh, dialectic between the two spheres in which community leaders and entrepreneurs, we'll meet them soon, uh, want autonomy and independence, they do want that, but still need the state in the picture to some extent, so more a story of interdependence between the two spheres um, with the state's background capacity to substantiate by act or omission, and we'll see by, uh, both examples, uh, the private tribunals claims for legitimacy, both within their own communities and also outward toward uh, the general population. Uh, one caveat I discussed in this presentation, Jewish religious adjudication alone. Obviously, the story gets much more complicated when we add non-Jewish communities into the story. And some of the actual institutional realities I'm going to describe here are replicated in the non-Jewish um, um, communities in Israel. So we can sort of pick that up in Q&A um, as well. Before so delving into the two uh, cases, a quick recap of the um, structure we're talking about. 
this is um, a highly simplified uh, design of what's actually going on uh, in Israel, but just to give um, a general impression of um, some of the central kind of players in the story we're talking about. So what, okay, what you see here on the right is basically what we would sort of find in any normal, right, civilian <laughs> court system. Okay. We have lots of civilian courts, general jurisdiction, specialized jurisdiction, uh, trial and appeal, as we know, and the Supreme Court kind of hovering above, uh, reviewing through appeal the decisions of civilian courts and um, also setting precedent in this sort of the common law tradition. What's perhaps most special about Israel is this column right here in the middle. So no separation of church and state in Israel. If you haven't heard of it, <laughs> that doesn't happen there, right? Israel has a lot of institutions which are sort of professedly religious, including religious tribunals. Uh, these, uh, what I call public religious courts in the sense of state-sponsored, state-funded, um, state state-run, right, uh, courts, but still religious courts, have exclusive jurisdiction only over matters of marriage and divorce, and each of the sort of uh, major uh, religious communities in Israel have their own court, even courts, so Christian, we have, let's see, um, 10 sure of any jurisdiction, right, Jews have more or less one, I'll talk about that, plus a um, religious form of appeal, which is an interesting point, I'll go back to that later, um, at least in sort of, um, religious Judaism, appeal is not a familiar institutional um, in reality. Interesting to see it in a modern state. Uh, so we have, we have that. <coughs> Supreme Court does have some power review over these religious courts, not in the, not in the direct sense of appeal, but as a sort of a, under its um, jurisdictional capacity as a high court of justice, it can review the decisions or the acts of any and all um, government institutions. And because these are government institutions, we do see some degree of review here, mostly in issues of constitutional administrative um, uh, law. This shaded area here is the area which we know in general is kind of the ADR, right? Everything else. So dispute resolution not sponsored by the state, alternative dispute resolution. I only highlighted one section of like a very large field that exists in Israel, like in the US and any other place, sort of arbitration uh, forums, mediation, and, and the sort of the general spectrum there. Some religious communities also have their own tribunals, which are not state sponsored, but basically do something similar, right? They run, they run religiously based adjudication, under but under the uh, under the structure of arbitration, right? So basically, you say we're, you're not going to be able to enforce our decisions through state uh, organs. If you want to, you're going to have to go through the process of arbitration. I'll do this a bit in case, and then so we can see that sometimes actually happening, right? We see we see religious uh, parties doing their own. Religious arbitration, I think we see here in the, U in the U.S. quite often as well, right, and, and different religi religions. And then if there's an issue with enforcement, we might see uh, a party going to the civilian court and asking for an enforcement order um, through arbitration law. Kind of complicated, and I'll mention that uh, also in a minute, right, especially when you're a member of a community that perhaps disincentivize, disincentivizes um, kind of taking disputes out, right, to the civilian uh, structure. So from an historian, okay, so this is the general structure as it stands today. The two interesting, the two sort of episodes I want to throw into this uh, story. First episode um, begins, at least according to one recounting of the Supreme Court decision in 2006 called the Amir uh, decision, in which the Supreme Court, in its uh, kind of constitutional administrative review capacity over decisions of the um, official or public uh, religious courts, reviews a unique practice that does not actually appear in this slide as it looks now. Okay, so what does it do? It looks at something that the religious courts have been doing, the state public religious courts have been doing for many years, which is adjudicating disputes not under their exclusive jurisdiction on marriage and divorce. How would they do that? They would basically, uh, parties would come forth and say, okay, you're also a religious bait then, a religious, um, sorry, you're also a bait then, right, a Jewish religious uh, court. We want you to adjudicate our commercial case, right, something we would often find in the ADR form. The court would say, okay, but I have no jurisdiction, right? I'm look, looking at the uh, sort of authorizing law. There's no jurisdiction there. What do we do? Why don't you just sign an agreement empowering me as an arbitration panel, right, to adjudicate your case, okay? So basically playing in this field while, right, sitting in the sort of the official uh, capacity of a, um, of a um, formal, uh, formal uh, tribunal. Interestingly, when the, when the religious courts would do that and then come out with a arbitral decision decree, right, and there would be an issue with enforcement, we would sometimes see parties going to civilian courts and asking for an enforcement order emanating out of a arbitration uh, held by a sort of formal uh, uh, public, uh, uh, public based in, right, public uh, religious tribunal. What happens in 2006? This practice comes under review of the Supreme Court. Supreme Court says, you know, you're a state institution like any other kind of public authority. All you can do is whatever the law allows you. We have 
alas, perhaps just as to say, we have a law that gives, grants you uh, exclusive jurisdiction in marriage and divorce. No law allows you to act as arbitrators in other fields. Stop doing that. Okay, so striking down basically, basically that, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, striking down that kind of practice. What happens next? So we can ask you know, what the Supreme Court thought would happen with the with this bunch of with this sort of uh, group of dispute that went to the formal uh, formal but they did or formal religious tribunals before the Supreme Court's decision. If we ask the court, not exactly clear. He says, well, first of all, there's this, right? You can just take all of your uh, commercial disputes, the uh, public civilian courts, no problem of jurisdiction there. That's what they're here for, right? To figure out your issues of um, contract, tort, labor, employment, um, uh, um, property, right? You can do that. Supreme Court in that 2006 case also says, and you know, I'm actually aware of the fact that there are some religious forums out here. If you're really interested in religious forums, no problem, you know, just use the ADR possibility of arbitration. <coughs> what actually happens after the Supreme Court decides? Okay, so now we can start kind of asking, um, perhaps doing some kind of a dynamic reality, sort of social reality analysis, right? Okay, so things don't stay the same after the Supreme Court makes its decision. Basically striking down an element of, sort of arbitral element in the uh, practice of these formal uh, formal uh, religious tribunals. So two main kind of processes um, ensue. One is a fascinating um, intra-religious, mostly orthodox uh, deliberation between community leaders in the Jewish religious uh, community on the impact of this high court decision. What do we do now? What should we tell parties who, before the decision, went here? Where should they go? Right? So now they have a choice, whether they go to the public civilian courts or go out of the system right, to the uh, private arbitration forums, which are still religious. And what happens is a really interesting, uh, a really interesting process in which uh, sort of quite a consensus evolves around decision that before the Supreme Court's decision, in the choice between these two alternatives, religious people should have gone here. Why here? I mean, these are two right, religious uh, tribunals that might look the same. Three male Orthodox rabbis right, adjudicating, adjudicating cases based on the same kind of uh, Jewish uh, religious law. Why should they have gone here? Because this is also a state court. So the fact that you're holding kind of state emblem and have direct access to state courts, courts of powers actually gives you an advantage, kind of normative advantage over the private ADR forums, and therefore a religious person should be wise to go to the state court. But now, these forums lost something, right? They can no longer do this kind of work. Where should religious people go now? And then we see a sort of a clear statement by many of these for prominent Orthodox rabbis in Israel. These forums now won sort of precedence over the public forums. People are encouraged to go there, encouraged, incentivized. So we know when sort of prominent rabbis give these decrees, right, there's also effect in terms of, kind of social, uh, social pressure and expectations. The other interesting process that happens, which is kind of institutional economic, um, or economic, uh, economic development, is what we see an evolution of a widespread industry, perhaps not that surprising, of these kinds of Jewish Orthodox uh, arbitration courts offering now, uh, including on websites and, and the, um, uh, various way, uh, means of, um, of publication, cheap, fast, and Jewish adjudication to anyone who's interested in that. And that's kind of interesting because sometimes we see non Jewish parties even going to these forums because they're actually really cheap, uh, fast, and they look quite nice. And what, what, what sense does it mean they look quite nice? Perhaps the most kind of clear aspect of this process of this burgeoning of the industry of private religious orthodox uh, arbitration has been what we may call um, a, an enhanced process of rationalization, modernization, and formalization of the adjudication in these forums. So I don't know what you had in mind in, uh, when you thought about a, you know, an orth a Jewish orthodox tribunal kind of sitting in justice. They look a lot like modern courts. If we look at their websites, we see now that these forums have fixed panels, designated and designed buildings and offices, standardized pleading, pleading forms, <coughs> formal rules of procedure, and even uh, sort of uh, taking on the process of reasoned and named opinions, I think we did not, which is not familiar from the history of Jewish education, and again, appellate review. So we start seeing, even in this field, which is ostensibly completely private, right, a, a kind of process of turning these forms into, if you will, like states, like state tribunals, right, looking a lot like what would have expected from a formal and rational uh, state system to, uh, to have. So what we see kind of two, I said, two-way process, right? On the one hand, 
a loss of state religious uh, loss of a state religious forum, right? That was um, perhaps more susceptible to public review. Right? It was under and the auspices of the state. Instead, right? Parties now have a you you might say a tougher choice, right? If you want public, you need to go to the civilian forum. If you want religious, you need to go to the private forum. Kind of this amalgam is no longer available to you. On the other hand, the private forum is not that private anymore, right? It's more public, trying to kind of imitate state practices and state norms in the way it proceed, its procedures um, look. Okay, the, um, the second episode, which I'll, which I'll speak much more uh, briefly, um, for, different, for various reasons, including the fact that the Supreme Court decision at hand here was only given um, a, few, a few months ago, and this is um, a story in which the Supreme Court, I'll just get this story. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> what I will do is uh, have some, uh, let's do some, uh, some graphics, at least that. Uh, this. Okay. So, uh, we, can, we can have like a quiz here, okay? I'm going to show you four pictures, and let's see what you think. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so this is picture number one. Where would you, what would you guess? Where does this belong? Safe. How so? There's a woman. Okay, so there's an emblem of the, of the state of Israel right here. That's a menorah, correct? There's a woman. Yeah, good there's point. We're, we're not going to see any more women in the yeah. presentation here. Okay, so there is a woman, female just, female judge. That's actually, as we'll see, a better, actually, um, a better piece of piece of evidence. There's also some computers and a printer, but today actually, um, the religious courts also have those, although they don't they don't appear um, in the in the presentation. Okay. Oh, so we have another emblem. Okay, so that can be the distinction. What is this? This is a formal, right, state, uh, um, formal state religious rabbinical court, right, religious court. This is actually not a real formal state. Um, I noted here this is taken from a movie that just came out uh, uh, today called Get, um, which is which is a highly kind of realistic depiction of what goes on in these uh, in these forums. It's kind of difficult to find, get a picture, but it looks like this. So this is, um, except, right, so um, three men, but apart from that, looks quite similar, I'd say. Okay, so no, no, no state emblem, right? Uh, here, what we, here we see is one of the most successful uh, kind of private uh, um, religious Jewish, uh, Jewish religious forums. Looks a lot like the previous one, right? Sorry, three men, beards, you know, the whole thing, this wooden, uh, uh, um, the, um, the wooden table, and the only thing is, right, we see here kind of the, the symbol of the private enterprise that's been running these, uh, uh, these, uh, these forums. So this is the example I'm not going to get to, but again we see a, a state emblem on a, an institution that is actually also a private forum, but once, just a few months ago, a Supreme Court, kind of specific Supreme Court approval to hand decisions that will actually be enforceable through state, inst state institutions because of a very special case, but this is again kind of a collaborative project, if you will, right? And a religious institution looks kind of exactly like the previous ones. This is an older picture, so the fashion is a little older as well, but apart from that, it looks pretty much the same, right? Um, but this is actually a private tribunal, which enjoys a kind of some kind of a, of public uh, recognition. The first thing they did when they got that was put up the symbol of Israel, right? I mean, we're private, but we have this opinion of the Supreme Court, so it might as well be called uh, public. Okay, so um, just a few uh, a few kind of concluding remarks. What like different kinds of uh, of insights we can take from this story? Um, so that's the Supreme Court. Let's compare it to the presentation that Hila gave him a few minutes ago, right? Clearly more equivocal than we might have thought on the issue of human rights impacting privatization. Okay, so we see a decision that in effect sort of um, pushes um, sort of a sector of litigation through privatized forums, right? Even though not discussing the issue of privatization uh, expressly, right? But just in terms of the court's ideology, obviously something more complicated is going on here. It, and it's, a, it's sort of questionable what exactly is the distinction, right? I'm, talk, uh, I'm sort of talking here about uh, trust in something we would call black box religious tribunals. Could this be something about religious or religion, right, that tells the state, you know, we can trust them without even looking what's going on there. That's what I call that black box. These cases do not include kind of evaluation of the procedures, of the quality of justice, of the, uh, the professional, uh, the professional um, uh, sort of capacity of the, of the judges. In that sense, kind of, kind of like, uh, you know, we also can see kind of a missed opportunity, right? Uh, um, in sort of asking questions about what exactly is the public or the private in these kinds of forums. And actually, if they had looked inside, they might have kind of been surprised, right? Found, found, found some more public in one place, some more private in the other. In the other. About state, oops, sorry. Stakeholders, right? The parties interested. 
So as I said, right, we could see these cases as sort of another story kind of pluralism, right? We actually, uh, we're recognizing another kind of non-state forum. Uh, but notice as I, uh, as I did, right, that by sort of sending people to, a single, to, to one forum, we're kind of eliminating another option. So whether this is kind of a pluralist success or, or actually demarcation, which might affect distributively different, community, different uh, individuals differently, is an, open, uh, is an open question. This is the example I'll, I'll hop over. And finally, I think perhaps what the most interesting um, insight of the story, what I call the dialectic uh, interdependence right between the two, pardon me, between the two uh, spheres. On the one hand, right, the Supreme Court resorts to these private providers of religious justice when public politics fail. And I'll talk about that, but there's sort of a whole argument about what, what exactly should be the powers of the official uh, religious courts. This discussion is not going to end anytime soon. Legislation is not going to, it's not going to be passed. The Supreme Court needs solutions. It finds its solutions in sort of the uh, private spheres of religious adjudication. But on the other hand, uh, just as interesting, right, the private courts, in a sense, need the state to measure up against to claim legitimacy. Right? This is, we're not doing this on our own completely. If, you, right, if we want to draw, we want to draw uh, audiences, we want to enlarge our constituency, we need to sort of realize the context in which people live. And that context is a modern, liberal democracy, at least to some extent, right? and therefore we need to sort of shape our understanding of religious adjudication according to how the state uh, perceives adjudication in general. And that's why I, sort of, I chose this uh, kind of title for the talk, right? judging away from the law but in the shadow of the law. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you all for coming and for organizing this panel, and I have more thanks. Um, I would like also to thank the uh, Hadassah Brandeis Institute for providing generous support to this uh, research and to thank my former student and current colleague, Dr. Inat Lavi, who is a collaborator in this uh, larger project. Um, I've got no one to lean on the negotiation of network relations among low-income mothers in Israel under a neoliberal discourse. Um, since the 90s, uh, many industrial nations have restructured welfare by cutting social benefits and implementing programs aimed at moving individuals out of welfare and into the labor force. These policies reflect the neoliberal principle of market citizenship, which emphasizes personal responsibility, self-reliance, and work effort. Studies, however, indicate that even though caseloads significantly, significantly declined after welfare reform, many families, and especially families headed by single mothers, were not able to make ends meet and endured severe material hardship as a result of low wages, a lack of social benefits, and the limited availability <coughs> of childcare opportunities. These new policies have also implicitly assumed that low-income families have private safety nets to fall back on in times of need. This assumption is questionable. Uh, prior research suggests that those in the greatest need of network support are the least likely to have it available to them. Um, and furthermore, welfare reforms have been criticized for weakening the communal ethos of care by making it difficult for low-income people to meet obligations to network members and to reciprocate support. And following this critique of this, the weakening uh, um, communal ethos of care, um, in this present study, I'm asking three questions, three major questions. Um, one, to what extent do low-income mothers in Israel, in this particular case, rely on their personal network for support? Two, to what extent do they feel obligated to reciprocate support? And three, under what conditions is the pressure to share and reciprocate resources likely to inhibit participation in social networks? Um, in the sociological and anthropological literature, reciprocity, the idea of give and take or helping those who helped you, has long been viewed as a powerful mechanism of social integration and solidarity. Uh, and this idea, I think, is best expressed in uh, the very famous uh, book of Marcel Mauss, um, the gift. Um, so in Marcel Mauss, but many other um, uh, anthropological work and sociological work, we see that the expectation and obligation to reciprocate favors establish a cycle of exchanges, which by tying people to each other through a complex web of mutual dependencies, facilitates the emergence and maintenance of social relationship, relationships. 
In this study, I suggest that reciprocity can also be a source of burden and a force of social fragmentation rather than social integration. Um, while it may be challenging to negoci negotiate social relationships in all circumstances, recent scholarship suggests that it might be especially difficult to do in conditions of poverty because of the scarcity of resources. Unlike more affluent families, not only is it more difficult for low-income families to provide and return support because um, these families are typically embedded in resource-poor networks, but these families are also more dependent on others because of their restricted ability to purchase services in the market. Therefore, I argue, poverty can limit the ability to uphold the norm of reciprocity and can impinge on the process of network building and mobilization. Um, Israeli society constitutes, I think, a particularly instructive case uh, for studying these issues because the recent adoption of neoliberal policies contrasts with its familiar character, which places the family at the center of both the individual and collective life. Um, since the early 2000s, Israel has ex increasingly adopted market-oriented neoliberal economic policies, a trend which has led to a serious retrenchment in social expenditures and a restructuring uh, of welfare. Particular attention has been paid to limiting the amount of support provided to single mothers. Um, however, as you can see here, welfare reform has not reduced poverty. In fact, poverty rates have increased since 2000, particularly among single-parent families, and despite the fact that the majority of these families are headed by a working parent. So what you see here is here about a slightly more than 18% is um, the poverty rate uh, among families in Israel, which is, by the way, one of the highest in the OSCD. You can see, I, I have this one, okay. You can see here, uh, this is the poverty rate among uh, parents, uh, uh, single-parent families. So it is substantially higher. This, by the way, are the latest data uh, provided by the National Insurance Institute. So these are, um, it has the, these data have been released in 2014. They refer to the previous year, 2013. Uh, even even single-parent families where they had, where well, the parent in the family is working, uh, we can see that the poverty rate is high. Okay, uh, slightly more than 16%. Um, so just going back to the previous slide. Okay. Um, in light of these um, economic changes uh, and the restructuring of welfare, um, we raise the question of to what extent can the family, as a private safety net, to what extent can it substitute for official aid? Okay, to research these questions, okay, um, th this research is based on uh, in-depth interviews conducted with some 40 Jewish low-income mothers uh, age 24 to 62, uh, in two areas, in Netanya and Haifa. Um, most participants were single mothers, but I should say that not all of them were single mothers, but uh, those women who, were, who had a partner or were married, their partner was incapacitated, so he couldn't work either because he was uh, um, having health problems or in jail or these kind of issues. Um, so that's very important because very often these women are the only, are the major breadwinner um, of the family. Uh, recruitment uh, was done through local welfare offices and non-profit organizations. Um, I'd like to turn now to the findings and I should say these are preliminary findings because I've just started with the analysis of the data and so I'll share with you some first, um, some first findings. Um, okay. um, consistent with prior research, uh, the preliminary findings show that the low-income mothers in this study frequently relied on their personal networks for support and received various goods such as food, clothes, appliances, financial support and assistance with childcare and transportation. Uh, most of the support was provided by uh, close relatives, so um, we're talking about parents helping <coughs> their children or siblings helping each other. Uh, only on rare occasions did members of the extended family, neighbors of friends, provide support. Um, many of the women who received support from the family interpreted that help in terms of the obligatory nature of the parent-child relationship, and they did not seem pressured to reciprocate. 
However, as Margaret Nelson showed in her study of low-income single mothers in Vermont, in order to promote a sense of balance in the relationship, the terms of reciprocation in the case of the parent-adult-child relationship are often expanded to also include gratitude and loyalty as terms of return. Nonetheless, for many of the mothers interviewed, support received even from close relatives was not something to be taken for granted. So consider, for example, the case of Barbara. Okay, that's a good um, example. Um, Barbara works multiple jobs, but still she's unable to meet her basic needs independently. And she has to frequently ask her family, mainly her father, for assistance. Um, consistent with the neoliberal idea of market citizenship, Barbara believes that her industriousness and her strong work ethic makes her make her responsible person worthy of receiving support from her family. Okay, she says here, I emphasized, if you sit and cry, no one will give you anything. I'm not like that, so it's fine. I do my absolute best and have a very strong ethic, so that's the secret. And this is why I'm worthy of getting support. Um, other women held a different view regarding the obligatory nature of familial relationships, although they too received substantial support from close relatives. Okay, and that's the case of Erin, uh, whose only source of income at the time of the interview was an allowance from the National Insurance Institute. Okay, Erin um, reported that her sister often helped her pay the bills and then stressed that she feels highly committed to her and pressure to repay her debt to her sister. Okay, there's no way I'm not giving it back to her. She said that several <coughs> times throughout the interview. Erin accounts, account resonates with Nelson's observation. Um, Nelson, who did the study among single mothers uh, in Vermont, that low-income mothers tended to feel embarrassed when they extensively relied on network members for support, especially family members, or when they were unable to adequately reciprocate the help they received. Um, Sarah, um, Sarah's economic situation is slightly better than that of Erin, uh, and interestingly, Sarah is able to uphold the norm of reciprocity with her welfare check, okay, which she uses to repay her debts to her sisters. So, uh, every, at the end of every month, when she gets the bituach leumi, the allowance from the National Insurance Institute, that's the time that she can repay uh, mostly her sisters and her mother for the help and the support they had, um, they gave to her. Um, and she's saying it's very clear to Erin, I cannot, uh, I can't not give back. If I don't give back, my relatives will not help me anymore. Sarah's mother and sisters may feel obligated to help her, but the support they provide to Sarah is conditional. It is very clear that Sarah's relative, relatives are able to support her as long as she is able to give back and return the support they provided. While most of the interviewees received at least some support from their family, several mothers reported they could not rely on their relatives for assistance. Okay, and that's the case of Slaid, that was one of the most um, um, difficult interviews. Um, Slade was suffering, for, was suffering from psychological problems, but she did not receive any form of official aid. Um, nor, she, nor did she receive help from her relatives, who lived, by the way, they, they lived in close, close, close proximity, they were in the same neighborhood, but her relatives didn't help her, although she was in a very difficult situation. Okay, I get nothing from my family, and I've got no one to lean on, I've got no one to ask for help, I don't even ask anymore, because I know what the answer will be. They, my brothers, um, they know what my situation is, they know everything, I don't hide it, uh, but they're not willing to help. And she, throughout their interview, she has a, a, a little boy, and she just describes how she, sometimes she doesn't even wake up in the morning to prepare a sandwich for her kid, and she just you know, stays in bed and, and, and basically she doesn't even get out of bed for sometimes for days. Um, and, uh, but she's very concerned that, um, that the welfare office will uh, find out that she has difficulties taking care of her kid and, they, and that they will, um, you know, take him out of the home. Um, that was a very difficult interview and, and we really, we get the impression uh, from that her narrative that reflects a deep despair and that she has just given up. Um, and it seems that 
uh, her inability to repay her debts to her brothers, to her family, has created enormous relational tension and has eventually led to her exclusion from the network. So no one wants to help her, um, even though you know, her parents, her brothers live nearby. Molly is another case of a mother who, despite severe material hardship, did not receive any help from her family, who also live, uh, lives in near, nearby. Um, Molly's life changed dramatically after she was wounded in a terror attack and after her relationship with her husband, who later died, became abusive. Mali explained that she decided to withdraw, voluntarily withdraw from her family because she did not want to be constantly harassed by her relatives. She felt that her family criticized her for not taking care of herself, meaning not overcoming, overcoming the trauma she had, um, not finding a job, not finding a new husband, or getting involved in a new relationship. Her withdrawal meant that she had to find alternative sources of support. For Mali, that was by turning to non-profit organizations. This is how we got to interview her. And also, she engaged in relationships <coughs> with men who gave her some financial support in exchange for sex. Okay, so that's again a very, uh, one of the more difficult interviews where um, really she refrained from asking, uh, from turning to her family for support and preferred to be in uh, exploitative uh, um, relationships with men um, to basically pay her bills. Um, so let me get to primary conclusions. Um, in family-oriented societies like Israel, helping close relatives in need is often treated as a duty to be fulfilled unconditionally. The finding, preliminary findings of this study, however, suggest <coughs> that often, at least among low-income families, this may not be the case. Although an important source of assistance, uh, and in line with the work of uh, Finch and Mason, it appears that reliance on close relatives uh, was part of a negotiated process that required the mothers to contribute back to the network. Those who, in the long run, were unable to do that uh, were eventually excluded, like Slaid, um, like the case of Slaid. In other cases, mothers like Mali refrained in the first place from turning to the personal network for support. Requesting support without being able to adequately reciprocate or relying too much on someone else's assistance can be a sign of dependence and incompetence which may open up the door to criticism <coughs> and control. Critical scholars like uh, Zygmunt Bauman have argued that the emphasis on personal responsibility in contemporary societies has given dependence a bad name by associating it with shame and degradation. Thus, the contradiction between these neoliberal values, on the one hand, and the constant struggle uh, to make ends meet, on the other hand, constitute a major source of tension for low-income women who often seek to conceal their needs and failures to meet them independently. Finally, the preliminary findings suggest that support from network members cannot be assumed to be widely available and provided unconditionally, and they cast some doubt on the ability of the private, of the private sphere to substitute for official aid. This has important policy implications in light of the recent retrenchment of welfare. The focus on individual responsibility, independence, and self-reliance may make reciprocity a burden that ought to be avoided. And it echoes Marcel Moss's concern that the decline in the principle of reciprocity in modern social relations is the major obstacle to the renewal of a contemporary social contract. Thank you. Hi everyone, I also want to thank uh, Jonathan, Malcolm, Rebecca and Roseanne for making this happen. And I'm also very happy to see my students in uh, my course on uh, Israeli Constitution Law here. Uh, I know it's hard, it's, very, uh, it's a hard time uh, to hear those, uh, those lectures that make you think and it's so tense. So bear with me, I'm going to be in between, I think, between Ila and Shira's uh, uh, talks. And I want to connect to the theme of our symposium through the case of privatized welfare in Israel. Uh, in August 2005, the Israeli, government, the Israeli government implements a major welfare reform, 
this reform adopts a strong approach of ending welfare and moving people quickly as possible into work, and that was more the policy aspect that Chira uh, talked about. But beyond this shift in welfare policy, the program also adopt, adopts a radical reform in welfare governance, and that will be my focus. The operation of the program was entirely contracted out to private firms as part of a broader gro global trend of reinventing government and uh, moving to a new public management. I want to uh, expand on this point because sometimes when we think about privatization, we think m about more a technical thing or pragmatical thing of uh, re replacing public workers with, with private ones. But if you look into the literature and theory of new public ma management, you, you find that it's much more than that. The shift to new public management was a result of an ongoing criticism of public agencies as being inefficient, wasteful, unresponsive, and over-bureaucratized. And the argument, which was theorized mainly by public choice scholars, was that government is a poor manager and that private firms are inherently more efficient than public bureaucracies. Why is that? First, because they are exposed to uh, competition, while public agencies are monopolies. And second, because the private sector, in the private sector, the profit motive incentivizes, uh, is incentivizes firms to be more efficient and innovative, while public workers do not have such incentives. They get the same salary, whatever they do, whether they do it, their jobs good or not. And on top of that, the public sector is overloaded with red tape of rules, of layers and layers of rules and laws and paperwork, which make it almost impossible to get anything done. Therefore, and based on this theoretical framing, uh, the big vision of new public management is to adopt the logic of the market, which creates those incentives for efficiency and responsiveness uh, uh, into the public services. The assumption is that if we get rid of the red tape <coughs> and create competition and get the incentives right, we can emulate the dynamics of the market in the public services so the providers of services will work like providers in the market and that way we will boost efficiency, we lower the price for taxpayers and increase the responsiveness to the clients. So new public management is not only about replacing the actors of public services, but basically, or actually, it's more about transforming the whole culture of public services to a market cu uh, culture. There, so if we look at that, there's, there are a lot of ways we can try to evaluate this transformation, but I want to use the uh, constitutional uh, perspective, the constitutional theory perspective. And from that perspective, this is a radical change that takes us back to the most fundamental questions of democratic accountability and the legitimate exercise of power. One of the main reasons why public agencies are so legalized is the principle of rule of law. In constitutional thinking, public law is the way we constitute the power of the, of the government, but also restrict it. However, private actors are usually not subject to public law. That is why legal scholars usually argue that new public management reforms, and especially the reliance on private contractors, create an accountability deficit and dilutes the traditional forms of public accountability. But the story is much more complicated than that, since the market mechanisms of new public management, beyond being tools of boosting efficiency, might also serve as alternative accountability measures. Let's go back to the question of legitimacy. Why we accept the decisions and actions of cops and doctors and administrators, welfare administrators? Uh, why do we accept uh, their uh, decisions and actions as legitimate? <coughs> Here I want to rely on Jerry Mashaw's uh, 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 theoretical framework in his seminal work on bureaucratic justice, and he identifies three models of legitimacy. The bureaucratic uh, rationality model, in which we accept the actions of bureaucrats because they are merely implementing policy that was set by elected legislators. The professional treatment model, in which we accept the decisions of professionals, like doctors, because uh, they are experts, but also because they are bounded by their ethics 
to work in the interest of their clients, and the moral judgment model in which we accept the decision of adjudicators, like judges, because they are impartial and they decide between compete, uh, competing claims according to fair procedures. Machau identifies those three models of uh, justice in welfare bureaucracies in the US during the 1980s. Building on Mike Adler's work, I think that market logic in new public management brings in at least two additional uh, models of legitimacy. The first I will call the performance model. In this model, like in the bureaucratic rationality model, we accept the decisions of service managers because they merely implement the policy of the legislator. However, this time, the policy is articulated in terms of results, in terms of performance, and not by bureaucratic rules. And the final model, which is not relevant to the case I will present, because uh, 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 welfare recipients in the welfare to work in Israel didn't get the op option to choose among providers, but when you also offer uh, public services recipients to choose among providers, then you can also use the model of client satisf satisfaction model, in which we accept the actions of service providers because the service customers are satisfied, and, and unsatisfied customers can move to another provider like in the market. The Israeli case of welfare to work is interesting, I think, because it illustrates how those new accountability and legitimacy models play out in reality. And the dynamics that they create, that are created when they interact with Mashau's traditional uh, models. Maybe the most interesting thing about the Israeli program is that it started as an extreme model of new public management, but it underwent strong shift back to law. In the, in in the initial stage, the main steering mechanism of the program was a performance-based payment model. The, uh, the contractors were paid based on reduction in income support payments in their re regions. And in addition, an additional bonus was paid for saving money on work support services. Now, this seems very uh, peculiar, but actually this model was designed by the economists in the treasury, in the Israeli treasury, according to a very conventional economic thinking of sharing the risks of the policy. So if the risk of the policy is paying, pay, is paying allowances, so this is the risk, so we should share the risk. And if you uh, reduce, uh, if the contractor has the same incentives, we align the economic incentive of the contractors to do that, so we make the right incentives. Uh, on the legal side, the program started with no detailed regulations on day-to-day -day operation, and the case managers of the contractors had wide discretion on how to achieve the program goals. The most important legal mechanism at that point was the right to appeal to a fair hearing board and then to the labor courts. But this governance structure was, structure was dramatically changed during the program implementation as a result of widespread expressions of mistrust in the contractors. And the outsourcing of discretion to the contractors was commonly perceived by many public actors as endangering the rights of program participants uh, of program participants. Such concerns were first raised by advocacy groups, but quickly they became dominant also in the media, and eventually they trickled down to official reports. Let's see, for example, the report of the uh, state uh, controller that was published two years after the program started. Uh, we can see, after he explains that the compensation to the firms is based on the saving in income support payments to the participants in the region, this saving can also derive from sanctions. The firms there, there, uh, therefore might be incentivized to apply sanctions to participants that they did not place in jobs. Seemingly, this creates a structural conflict of interest between the, ec the economic consideration of the firm and its obligation to work in the interest of the participant. In a similar way, a special public committee <coughs> of the Israeli Academy of Science, which evaluated the program, pointed out that since the, the economic model shifts risk to the contractors, they, uh, uh, their effort to score high on the performance might, I quote, 
come at the expense of safeguarding the rights of the participants. As a, as a response to those mounting public concerns over the trustworthiness of the contractors, the regulatory department uh, significantly increased the legal controls over the contractors. It published a manual of about 170 pages of detailed rule-based regulations on the day-to-day -day management of the program. It increasingly, it increasingly applied public law norms such as transparency and due process to the contractors. And the program participants were granted a right for publicly funded lawyer to represent them at the fair hearing tr tribunals. And that goes even beyond the rights of people vis-a-vis -vis the public employment uh, uh, agency. So we can see that after a strong reliance on market-based steering of the program, there was a strong shift back to law. How can we explain that? If we go back to the questions of accountability and acceptability and to Masha's modified model, I think that the case gives us, gives us several important insights. First, the case demonstrates the limited capacity of market accountability, or more accurately in our case, the performance model uh, of legitimacy, uh, to serve as an alternative legitimacy model in complex and hard to define tasks as many of the social services are. I don't have enough time to develop that, but it's obvious that if you want to use outcome-based measures, it's very complicated as you move from very, uh, very simple cleaning methods and when you shift to security, prisons, welfare, which are much more complicated and hard to define in this outcome-based manner. Further than that, <coughs> this indicates that while sometimes uh, like someone smart said, someone, uh, the process is the punishment. Often, the public, often in public services, the process is actually the product and not only a, a, a mere something that you do uh, in between. Uh, and in the Israeli case, not only that the performance accountability was insufficient, it was perceived as even increasing the conflict of interest. The second interesting uh, insight, I think, is how law and the legal concepts of legality and fairness still dominate our intuitions about the appropriate way that, uh, that we should do things in public services. This, this strong legal conception of what is the public sphere might be explained by a Selznick-like -like argument according to which due process is actually the natural law of public governance, but, it can, but uh, it can be also explained by a more historical explanation according to which decades of welfare delivery by public service, by, excuse me, by public workers have imprinted sent, uh, certain expectations as to how power should be operated. Those expectations, so it seems, continue to shape our views on the proper exercise of public functions even when they are privatized. So this is more uh, a path-dependent kind of argument or explanation. And third, the, the third point is that I think that the case well illustrates the clash between the legal and the market logics in terms of legitimacy. If we think about it, look at the three first models of Masha's uh, models, if we think about it, all of Marshall's traditional models of legitimacy are based on the absence of private interest on part of the decision maker. We accept the decisions of bureaucrats, professionals, and judges because we believe that they have no personal interest in the outcome of their decisions. Once the private interest gets in, the one that the public choice theorists thought this is exactly what is missing, right? This is in new public management writing, this is exactly what is so bad about public, uh, 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 public administration. There's no this personal motivation and incentives to do things. But once it, uh, public interest gets in and the, and the performance model does not provide a sufficient legitimacy as in, as in our case, it is harder to rely on the traditional models of legitimacy. This problem becomes even more serious when significant rights are at stake and as the conflict of interest is stronger and also more visible. The privatization of welfare comes with a price. 
intensified mistrust in street level decision making. Paradoxi paradoxically, the strong move back to legal controls was perceived as the most efficient way to reinstall legitimacy. For some legal scholars, that may be seen as the end game. If we go beyond the traditional divides between public and private law, and we extend public law to the private actors, to the, the private contractors, there is no accountability deficit anymore. And this is an important uh, point. Such hybridity is not only in contracted out services. It's becoming widespread also within public agencies since public workers as well are increasingly being evaluated and paid according to results. Legal scholars, okay. uh, legal scholars who usually focus on privatization often miss this point. And so to wrap up, I would say that those hybrid models might sometimes work better than traditional bureaucracy. But sometimes, and especially as privatization is moving to more complex and sensitive services, they introduce new problems. Like in our case, we see this shift back for legitimacy, but actually what we see is pushing very strong on the accelerator, going to the market with strong incentives, and at the same time pushing very strong on the brakes, on the law. And that might, might be very interesting, uh, but also might crea create great instabilities and tensions. So we are still trying to figure out what is going on. What is going on. So I think we are moving to more complex. So I think we need to get a much more nuanced understanding on how those sometimes conflicting normative system, systems interact especially in terms of democratic values and the legitimacy of uh, public governance. Thank you. Everybody did good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this, 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 this is really, this is really fantastic, and one of the reasons, uh, one of the reasons it is, I think, is that we're not talking about some little country way over there. We are talking about that, but these issues are generic. Everything that the four, the four speakers have said today ought to resonate with public policy issues in the United States, Western Europe, just about any industrialized uh, country. This sort, these same sorts of issues are, are, are going on. There's something, there's maybe something valuable about, about Israel. Israel's a tiny country and it may be like, we can kind of be like anthropologists and wrap our head around it because we talk about one prison privatization, one welfare system, not 50 or 90 or 2,000, you know, so, so, it's, so it's, it's because it's smaller, maybe may be able to get its head, we may be able to get our head, but, but it certainly re resonates uh, with us. Uh, having said that, there are some differences. Uh, uh, we pride ourselves in the United States as being pluralists, but we're not really very pluralist. We're pretty uh, homogeneous. Uh, there's real pluralism in Israel. And so we can, we can, we can, and so that, that's a that's a good lesson for us to consider a, a pluralist. There are pluralist ethnic groups and religious groups, just intense, intense, that make some of our American differences, cultural differences, at least, uh, at least pale in the night. And I, I must say, I'm going to say one, one, one. Brief introduction. Hila, it is wonderful to find somebody that is criticizing the uh, the the the, uh, the Israeli uh, 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 prison case. I almost got thrown out of the the, the dining room of Moda Kremnitzer and his wife when I suggested maybe it wasn't such a bad decision, <laughs> or what is even before it was going to come down. They they just thought that was impossible. So 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 it's so so it so it's so it's nice. But let me let me uh, let me make let me make a a few s sort of. Uh, gen general comments that apply to more than one to, to, to see what it is. Uh, one of the things that clearly comes out, and, and Avishai, uh, 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 well, everybody alluded to it, but it, then as you wound up, you did, that is privatization covers a huge, huge range of alternatives, uh, ranging from simply uh, substituting a private uh, contractor to do something that previously a public uh, agent had done to, to really putting in market uh, 
trying to trying to substitute market uh, institutions for what had previously been uh, pub public institutions and 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 everything everything in, in between so it, it covers a, a, a lot of ground but let me let me let me let me try to let me try to to uh, to identify uh, some some big themes uh, uh, Hila discusses the 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 uh, the, uh, uh, the the private prison doesn't like the decision we share that although for different reasons I think uh, but what she points out, it was, it was a really good policy. And as a result of that really good policy that the Supreme Court just ignored. But uh, I mean, I may be overstating it, but not, I don't think a whole lot. On the other hand, uh, Avishai looks at what is a terrible situation. He tells me later that, he, that they copied it from Wisconsin. Beware of uh, presidential candidate Walker, maybe. Uh, but, uh, but, it, but at any rate, it, it is, it's, a terrible, it's a terrible process. And interestingly enough, Hila likes privatization, at least is willing to go down the, the, the road. And he's, uh, he's sort of pulling back on it. And it may be a function of the particular institutions uh, that, that they looked at. But I pointed out. Uh, on, on the other hand, uh, on, the, on the other hand, the uh, uh, Ori, it seems to me that in your two cases you only talked about, my, my impression is the court got it about right. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it cuts both ways. It's interesting, but it's moving along. And the, the Shemish case is really interesting as well. But it got it about right. And then, and then, and then of course, the, the, the last, the last, the, 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 the study of, of the interviews with the women is just, is just, is just a, a, a ter ter terrible tragedy. And so, and, and, and so, so, so we, we see, we see some things. But let me, let me make some, let me make a, a very briefly some, some comments. And I'll turn it back to John to, uh, to, to comment. Uh, one is on the prison case. I don't, I'm not even sure, that, I don't think this would be a good case for the, for the court to have explored the nexus public-private. Whatever we think about it, one would, one would, I think most of us would agree that, 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 uh, that one of the core functions of the state, just a basic core functions of the state would be national defense and right next to that would be internal defense and that would be that would be punishment so i'm not i'm not sure you'd want to take a core function of the state and then use that as the as a good case for trying to distinguish to trying to tease out the the integration of public and private or the the, the, the divisions there all those are. and secondly i don't even think it's an anti private I don't even think it's an anti-private uh, uh, argument that that that, that uh, Justice Banish makes. It's a it's a radical statist argument, and I think we. But, but at some point, she stops talking about the majority opinion. Stops talking about uh, about uh, about uh, 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 the ills of the market and for-profit people, and they start talking about the core functions of the state, and. I kept thinking, I'd just come from Australia where the state did a pretty good job of private prisons, and then I kept thinking, what if offenders in Minnesota were, uh, from Wisconsin, were repatriated to, uh, uh, to uh, Wisconsin to do their time? Because they would be closer to their families. This would be inappropriate under the under the uh, under under the court's ruling. It would it would categorically be rejected because the argument is the institution that levels the uh, that that levels or or imposes the punishment must must has the moral responsibility of imposing it. So we couldn't have reciprocity between Minnesota and Wisconsin or Vermont and New Hampshire being smart and building one prison for the two states and things like that because that would violate the principles. So it's 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 more on a, it's more on a radical status function rather and of course the, the, she, they don't mention at all nonprofit uh, institutions. Incidentally, the, the, the court is totally silent on the 13 of the 15 uh, uh, juvenile institutions that are run by private nonprofits in, in Israel, although I take it they've created a fig leaf to, uh, to allow them to operate within, within the principle. Anyway, anyway, that's one of the issues I, I, I might like her to, uh, to, to, com to, come, to come back on. Um, 
uh, Ori, it strikes me that you're, that, 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 the, the, that the court decision uh, was about right. How can you have a, how can you have a, a, a state body paid to do certain things, do other things that it's not? And so the formalism of the court makes a lot of sense, and the response makes a lot of sense. Now the the, the Dean are catching up with the B'day Dean in the United States, because they're doing that in Williamsburg and Muncie and lots of places and have been for a long time. So good for them. That seems to be not bad. That's part of robust, robust, robust uh, uh, pluralism. And and now we have we have a competitive uh, we have a competitive court system. It reminds you of the development of the common law, doesn't it? Uh, one of the things you might w worry about, at least I worry about, you know, once a month, is that uh, everywhere courts courts are colonial. Courts want to subject the natives to a centralized system. And, and maybe the natives ought to respond back and develop their own indigenous systems. And, and, and so that's what we see in Israel. So that strikes me as robust, uh, robust plurality, uh, pluralism, even if, we, even, if we might, even if we might not like it. Sure, this is, this, this, these, are, these are terrible. But let me, but let me, let me, let me suggest this. I mean, I like the discussion of of, of Mouse and Goldner. These are great, uh, great uh, authors and favorites of, of mine. But uh, I, I want to draw on a little bit of a book that is uh, that will be out soon by a colleague of mine, also a clerk to Justice uh, ju to Judge Newman in in, in Connecticut. Uh, uh, Ed Rubin, a former faculty member here. Uh, Ed has a book coming out saying that there is a dramatic change in in ethic in modern, you know, Western liberal societies. And the change in the ethic is the shift from duty, a sense of duty, to a sense of fulfillment. And what, account, uh, to, what accounts from the ethic of duty to the ethic of self-fulfillment? He argues it's the rise of the welfare state. The rise of the welfare state provides individuals some basic assurances and protections that allows them greater opportunities that they had when they were when they were in you know in in pre pre welfare welfare days. If that's right, then the decline. Uh, if he's right, let me hypothesize the decline of the ethic of reciprocity and care is a consequence of the rise of the welfare state, they're the bad guys, and of course the bad guys have become worse when they pulled the rug out from under the welfare state with neoliberalism, and no longer, we no longer have the, 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 the ethic of duty and responsibility and reciprocity, and we no longer have the welfare state that is, that is allowing us minimum uh, uh, levels of existence so that we can so that we can uh, so that we can fulfill ourselves so so that's so that's that that may be that may be the this may be the the sad uh, the sad uh, the tragedy of the of, of, of the shift from the welfare uh, state society to neo neo neo, neo uh, uh, liberalism and 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 and, and Avishai, I'm I mean this is it's, this is your story. is is the most shocking of all these uh, uh, to, to me. To to see a to see such a welfare uh, a system uh, transformed into a system in which the line staff almost get for every shekel they save is a shekel earned. I mean, this is a terrible, terrible, a terrible model uh, of administration. But I want to point out the difference between the privatization of the welfare scheme and the privatization of the prison. In the private prison that she so nicely describes, you basically take a model of a prison and you contract out a private company to run that prison, and the regulations are through contract. In fact, there was more regulation circumscribing the private prison than there was for the public prisons. And that's the case wherever uh, uh, privatized prisons uh, work well, and Australia is a, a place where that happens. In this case, you really substituted a welfare bureaucracy for sort of a, a, almost a mom and pop operation of a, of, of a market where, where we're constantly, I mean, just basically profound conflicts of interest. How many of you have bought a house recently or will buy a house? Over the last 30 years in this country, 
uh, a, a, a single realtor is not likely to uh, to represent both the buyer and the seller. There's an it, there's a, there's just a flagrant conflict of interest in this, right? But this is exactly what the Israeli welfare scheme, and you're, I guess you're telling me the Wisconsin welfare scheme. I'm, I spent time in Wisconsin. I feel embarrassed. Uh, uh, it operates. So it's so it's a so it's a, so it's a it it's no wonder that the response has been has been the development of law and more law. Because it strikes me that uh, that uh, that even capitalism operates on law, and the market operates on law and more law, and so one sees the, one one sees that 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 uh, that, that evolution. Um, anyway, that's what I have to say. Uh, John, you come up and moderate questions and comments. Uh, these are fantastic. Uh, let me one last thing. Are these papers going to be available on websites or something, uh, uh, Roseanne? <laughs> yeah, but, oh, I don't know how to make sure they ought to be. How to make sure they ought to be. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let's give a big round to all our speakers and to our, our commentator for a really a, a feast of, of research and discussion. And you've been very patient, and we've got a good group left, and we've got because of uh, the disciplinary matrix of Malcolm Feely, we've got a good 20 minutes to talk. So let me uh, suggest, uh, maybe I'll take a couple at a time and we'll come back up here. So how about one, and two in the back? All right, why don't you start and then we'll get yours. Uh, if we take history into account, or as a background, until emancipation, uh, some of the areas that are now in discussion being private or public were privileges. And no one wanted to go to the state to, to ask them to adjudicate certain matters, in religious matters, maybe in criminal matters. So why, why is now uh, Israel, why has this become a problem in Israel? Do they have less confidence in their own capacity to decide these matters and so they want to keep uh, to adjudicate them on a public sphere because until uh, the, the 18th century that was not the case it was a family affair and uh, so uh, just a compliment to the question if uh, the religious population in Israel is a minority relative minority why should uh, these matters be adjudicated in a public and not in a private? And are there different religious uh, frameworks, for example? Would the Natura Carta want to be adjudicated by the Zionist state? And I mean, you talked mostly about some sort of material, um, material form of support. Is there anything like, and then you mentioned the the lady who didn't get out of bed for days at a time. Is there any sort of research on the maybe emotional support or sort of uh, that kind of network um, for people like that? I mean, or who are for single mothers, because I think that's also an important part of you know helping somebody break out of that sort of cycle. The Beth Din, right, the religious, uh, Jewish Religious Tribunal, is, it's a fascinating institution, especially when it comes to Israel, right? Why, in one sense, it's a two millennia old institution, basically created uh, a long, long time ago, and, uh, and sort of operates within local communities, as you say, with no relation to, the, with very little relation to the states in which the Jewish communities resided. What happens in sort of the early 20th century is that, <coughs> um, uh, uh, um, is that the uh, governing powers in Palestine, not only there, but it begins with the, Turk uh, with the Ottoman uh, Empire, and then a British mandate kind of formalizes it, start, starts to say, okay, you know, we're actually going to formalize your, uh, these institutions and give you some access to public course of power. And so that's a, very, that's a very new and unique thing that the, uh, these institu institutions did not know before, and actually made them so go through a very interesting and highly complex and process of decision making, including, for example, so the British say, you want access, you want to be kind of public, Institutions, you need to have at an appellate level, right? And that's uh, something, right? That uh, Jewish law does not know about. And there's an interesting discussion. They decide, okay, we'll go for it. Yeah, we want we want access to this power. And then when Israel comes comes in 1948, basically says we'll keep the same structure. 
And now we're 60 years later, right? And the sort of, um, relevant religious communities see there's actually some, some benefits to having this direct access to public power, public funds. Um, and sort of the most, most, I guess, fascinating aspect of the story is like the past few years, we see that kind of an internal halachic, right? Internal religious uh, discussion also starting to recognize that. So we're kind of locating these benefits, which we can think of as sort of uh, material or uh, kind of strategic or political in halachic sources themselves. So the attachment to the state be, uh, starts to become a, um, a sort of religious interest, or religious uh, um, source of, of power. Um, and just uh, um, to complicate the story a little bit, and th this goes to your second, uh, second comment, obviously, first of all, there are ultra-Orthodox reclusive communities which do not play this game, right? But they still have their own Matei Din, right? Their own religious, uh, their own ultra-Orthodox uh, tribunals which formally we would think of them as arbitration panels, but why, why do I say formally? Because none of the members of these communities would ever sort of go to a civilian court to enforce that decision. So the kind of the powers of internal enforcement are so strong that there's no ex expectation to actually go through arbitration, uh, arbitration process, but that's not the whole story. And this is part of the 18th century revolution, right? There are some things today we cannot do without the state. So for example, right, and that, that applies to the Nturikata, right, to the ultra, ultra, ultra orthodox Jews as well, right? They, they want to enjoy the welfare system? Some of them do, right? They have to pay taxes? They do, right? They, uh, they, want, they want the public uh, transportation uh, uh, company to run a bus through, from Naybrook to Jerusalem? They, they do, okay. So they have to play, to play the game. Part, they, want to, they want to have, when they travel out, from Israel, uh, out of Israel, they want to have their uh, marriages and divorces recognized, say in the US or in Belgium? They do. These countries only look at right, official, formal documents. So what we see, for example, is a ultra, ultra orthodox uh, tribunal sits in Jerusalem, marries and divorces these uh, these couples with, without any regard to whatever the state does, and then sort of this uh, official goes with all the all the documents once every week to the public uh, Beit Din, and that's just to get the state stamp so that these people can actually have also a formal divorce, for example. Okay, so we see this interdependence even applying to the most extreme and reclusive groups. Shira, did you want to comment? Yes. Um, so I think the, the case of the ultra-Orthodox uh, community is very interesting because it has, um, at least in terms of support, it has really institutionalized um, mechanisms to provide support to the community and that's very strong in terms of financial support, um, in terms of s so supporting um, educational, uh, the education of children, um, providing um, uh, goods for the sick, um, you know, those kinds, it's really around material and the financial support. Um, and what's interesting, well, this study uh, was, the, the vast, the overwhelming majority um, were secular or traditionalist, but there were a couple of ultra-Orthodox uh, women that we managed to interview, and clearly they were doing better off, they were better off. Uh, and I think that in in those types of communities that are really tightly knit, um, and um, and there's a sense of duty, there's really a sense of duty, and and in in sociology um, uh, there's this contradiction between duty and 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 reciprocity. In, in you can find that in in Alvin Guldner. Um, seminal work where, you know, there are no considerations of reciprocity when your duty is to help. And so in groups where you have a very strong collectivist ethos and you have this pressure that it's your duty no matter what or no matter what if you get back or, you know, um, you have to help. Um, I think that the members of these groups really benefit and we can see that in the ultra-Orthodox community. Now what's interesting and this is also in response to the other question about emotional support, um, not from this study but uh, um, from a different study uh, conducted by a, a student of mine who who, who is ultra-Orthodox, and she managed to get into the ultra-Orthodox ultra community because for some, someone who's not ultra-Orthodox, that's something very difficult to do. So she was able to, to get in, as part of that community, she was able to get um, an interview and also survey um, um, people in, in the ultra-Orthodox community. So what's interesting is that there's a very, and it's in, it institutionalized, this mechanism of providing support. Uh, but what's taboo is emotional. The emotional realm is taboo. Um, 
you, you don't talk about emotional problems, you don't talk about psychological problems, that's taboo in the ultra-orthodox um, community. Um, and it can create a lot of um, many problems that you have to find an answer outside of the community. Um, and, um, and it's stigmatizing. So there are many issues around, the, the, um, around providing um, emotional support. Uh, with respect to this study, um, this study really focused uh, on the strategies of low-income women to make ends meet. And so um, I've just you know, started analyzing the data, so I want to be careful here. Um, but my impression is that the issue of emotional support didn't show up much, but it could really be a, a, by, um, a methodological bias or a byproduct just because of the type of questions we asked. Uh, but what's interesting, going back to the U.S. and to the study by Margaret Nelson on single mothers, low-income single mothers in Vermont, that the same dynamics uh, exist with respect to emotional support. And so if you, you know, there, there are cases there of women who, you know, they're getting a lot of support emotionally, but they're not able to give back, and at the end they're just excluded from the network. So, um, so it seems like the sim similar dynamics are in different realms. So let's get a couple of more questions. Thank you, Professor Aronson. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the phenomenon in the US uh, involving the proliferation of arbitration provisions in standard form contracts, uh, employment, real estate, medical, th throughout, throughout our uh, culture. And with the willingness of the United States Supreme Court uh, to enforce those provisions, uh, even with respect uh, to statutory claims such as anti-discrimination claims uh, uh, and the like. Is there a similar phenomenon in Israel? And if so, how, how has it been dealt with? Okay, I, I think I have a more general kind of question for all of the panelists that is trying to figure out sort of how to synthesize all of these talks on this. I think Hila used the term spectrum of private to public, um, and then sort of Ori used this concept of in the shadows when you're talking about private in particular. And so sort of thinking about what the limits of the private are, where the failures of the public um, are and sort of where your talks kind of intersect with one another because on the one hand there's a critique of the privatization but in some cases the privatization of some of these institution works in other cases it's drastically failed and so how do you know uh, maybe even to speak to one another about the that spectrum and where the limits are where the failures have been um, where the possibilities are around these and you know even just to throw out Another example, um, you know, in this country there have been enormous critiques as well about security around and the privatization of the military abroad and those kinds of questions. So, you know, where are the limits um, and yet where, where, where have there been some success particularly around uh, questions of arbitration and adjudication, mediation and things like that? Thank you very much. So you want to start Ori and then we'll open it up. Um, so thank you. The short answer is yes. Um, so with the, with the kind of classic Israeli lag of like uh, two decades after whatever happens in the U.S., so now we have like a, a highly active ADR um, kind of culture, and that also is represented in uh, many kinds of contracts, um, and in general highly supported by uh, by the court system and the politicians, and everyone everyone is about um, caseload management and, and the, those issues are totally familiar from the U.S. and actually the same arguments are being brought over, the same experts are being brought over. So it's a, it looks like a, a real replication. Um, you know, I mentioned sort of the convoluted medical uh, system here. When I arrived, I uh, sadly had to go to a dentist. And so <laughs> the first document was my medical history. The second was an arbitration agreement, which actually I, I, um, I haven't seen that in Israel, so maybe we're not. <laughs> Not as bad, um, but so in general that does uh, that does uh, exist. Uh, interestingly, sort of there is, but um, decisions like proven privatization, this kind of debate is also exists, right? And then we do see some kind of uh, um, kind of uh, 
uh, effect, um, yeah, effect on, on, the, on these kinds of, uh, of discourses. Just for example, a couple of years ago, a justice minister who was also a private attorney, which might be relevant, uh, tries to push a legislation that would uh, call the mandatory arbitration law, which would basically take chunks of cases from lower courts and just send them to lawyers to arbitrate. But no choice. So I'll just compel parties to to, to litigate uh, to litigate in uh, in these private uh, hospitals, right? And this is now stuck in Knesset for like three years, apparently apparently dead. And what we do see some chief justices, some former chief justices, and other kind of uh, people say, you know, we have this interesting discussion about privatization. This might go too far, right? So whether adjudication is, is somewhere is somewhere on that field. I'm just noting that because sort of the cases I reviewed here in this presentation, obviously do represent a willingness to move some sort of adjudications to or uh, to private spheres. So uh, I'd say that's still a negotiated uh, sphere. Yeah. So do you want to, some of the other members of the panel like to address uh, Rebecca's point question? Should we, do you want to? Thank you. Um, so thank you, Rebecca, and uh, thank you, Malcolm, for your comments. And I kind of want to uh, integrate my response to them. Um, <clears throat> um, because the, the question of how to put these in, in, I think, in context for me is a question of exactly of that spectrum and to think about uh, each of these cases uh, where we, we need to end up doing a cost-benefit analysis and distributive analysis and who, who lost and who won and, and what happened uh, on the ground. And I think for me, at least, and the way I, I view the role of law here is a lot of it is about the on-the-ground aspects, which is something that, at least in the previous prison privatization case, didn't ever, it never opened. We don't know what happened on the ground. Right? We couldn't, we can't know. Um, but, um, it, but, uh, linking that to to what Malcolm said, and I, I actually don't know if if it was a you know if it was a good policy. I, I'm not necessarily a, I'm not a huge lover of privatization, but um, I reading that case, I think it was a very strong. It was kind of a it's like somebody writing it from a dream and not from the ground, right? Not from how the state operates in reality, and not from how prisons look like in reality, and not from what the state can do in reality. And that's where I feel like law is, fails. When law doesn't meet reality, it fails. And so that that's my main critique of this uh, of this um, of this opinion. That is is a very theoretically and philosophically interesting opinion, but I think on the, is really problematic when the state that describes doesn't exist, the limits that it describes as, as, as uh, compelling don't exist, because as you said, some of the system is already privatized. Um, so there's so much of it that just occurs as in a, was in a, in a fantasy land that it's, it's really, really problematic. Um, so um, so, so I, that's basically uh, my response here. And I think it just to connect, kind of to, to carry on the conversation, I think that the Avishai's paper and my paper have a very strong correlation in that sense because we both are kind, trying to look at the nuances of how does it look. And, and Avishai um, uh, is doing a very interesting uh, analysis and a very close analysis of the, of the problems that occurred in the system. And just kind of to, to complete the picture, the pilot was not continued in Israel. So now there's a whole, whole question what's going to happen, but the whole this, the Wisconsin program in Israel did not <coughs> continue. So I think that's another, uh, it's, it's another, interesting, uh, another interesting element here. But I think there's a lot of comp complementarity between uh, the way both of us looked at, at the issue. Should we go down the line then? Uh, thank you. Uh, Yes, I, I want to follow up uh, Ila. I think the issue is uh, getting a more nuanced. Uh, many times the discussion is tends to be to go to the limits, which is more interesting, and you are for it or against it, and I think it's more contextual. And some of it is that privatization is moving much faster than us understanding it. And we don't have still full understanding of how it works out. And uh, I agree that the case uh, I examined is quite extreme, but I think that all the, the solution that we just cut and paste what we've done in the government to the privatization 
this is not still this is not a full answer because some of it is due to the fact that there is a middleman there is this commitment to another firm or uh, with his own interest which might be a real thing of conflict or just perceived we just have this potential problem of trust so uh, and and the other thing we all, we tend to th th to talk about privatization but i tried to uh, uh, emphasize that it's also inside government what happens when we pay cops according to the number of fines they give and there, there are such sometimes they are not visible enough but there, we have such the same uh, challenges that go beyond privatization and that's why I emphasized on new public management because new public management it's not about pri only about privatization it's only one thing and the more flattered one it's taking the the logic of the market with all its advantages and put it in a machinery that was designed constitutionally according to a logic of law, a logic of fairness, and when they collide, many interesting things come true. I will, I will make two last points. First, I think we need to talk more about our assumptions or intuitions, how being working for a private company under the same regulations, under public law, so being without this argument of defi accountability deficit, will play out. Will public and private will act the same under the same formal or the realities in 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 in, in on the ground will be different i have a different or i have intuition that it will work different not all the time against the welfare recipients i know i i had a thesis uh, students that checked one example in which there was competition and privatization and some of the inten incentives were for the, the, the service uh, uh, to, to, to a greater take up in the, in the elderly care case. So we don't know in advance how exactly it works. Sometimes it's not always against the welfare recipients. It sometimes uh, it works in their interest. So it's more complicated. <coughs> Once you take those two logics and they play together and interact and you don't have this separation of here it's legal, public law, here it's market. So we have those hybrids everywhere all the time but once you take uh, you make this as a policy the tensions and it, it becomes much more intense the interaction and therefore i come back to the issue of we need a more nuanced understanding of it and the last point is will the u.s be uh, something i i ask myself w will the u.s will be different than israel uh, on on ground of this more statist ethos of Israel, because in many cases I think it gets back who would trust more or who, who fear or who would trust less. For someone, we, I don't trust either of them, but I trust more the firm. It's more accountable, there are customers, there are efficient and so on. I think that in my intuition, Americans will tend to that to, to be in trust, uh, to trust more the market than the government. In Israel, I think the general, and we are moving, it's shifting, it's very general, it's not accurate enough, but the general, maybe Baelish's intuition, Barak's intuition would be, I trust, even if they are inefficient and so on, I trust more the government. And it comes back to, actually, it's interesting. It comes back to the fundamental tension of efficiency versus fairness. This goes through all administrative uh, uh, of the state all the time. Once we thought that the bureaucracy is the efficient way of delivering services, and in the New Deal, the same dilemma was efficiency versus fairness. Fairness won, and we, try, we started to legalize the administrative state with more and more legal restrictions. And I think the same will, will happen with the privatization. And my case, I think, uh, shows again that fairness, it's, uh, even if you promise efficiency of the market now, fairness will come first. <coughs> but now we are moving not for a legalized administrative state, but this private public market <coughs> law structure, which is much more complex. I'll stop here. Um, okay, so just in response to Hila, Hila's comment, he said the law has to be connected to reality. So maybe that's, you know, the disciplinary difference between you and me uh, as a sociologist of 
you know, dealing with the reality of basically showing implications uh, and the in implications of the law or of some policy for the everyday life of, of people. And in this particular um, example, um, you know, low-income women, although this is, you know, I should say this is a, a qualitative study. Most of my research is quantitative, but this is quali a qualitative study. And, um, you know, we should be careful about generalizations, but still I think that the voices that we get from the ground, um, you know, we need them in order to evaluate what, you know, to have the law and the policies connected to reality. Or do you want the last word? Okay, so I would like you all to join me in thanking these scholars for temporarily laying down their, their invisibility cloaks and coming out as the great scholars and teachers they are, and we'll let you go back to work. Thank you.